thank you for um, inviting me here. I'm going to share my screen. Can you just confirm that you can see those lights? Yes, ma'am. Wonderful. OK, I'm going to try to navigate this on two machines at the same time, as promised. Um, so yeah, hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much to um, the organizers for inviting me. Um, I know this is the new reality for 18 months. I've been traveling around the world from sitting in my living room, and this is maybe the most wonderful destination all the way to, to India. So um, thank you all for coming along to um, this talk, which I have named Object uh, 51, Publishing uh, a History of Intellectual Property in 50 Objects, which is my uh, co-edited volume that was published indeed with Cambridge University Press in um, 2019. I've been introduced now several times, so I don't have to uh, repeat this, um, but I have an interest in both film and intellectual property and and um, all my research uh, sits at that um, intersection. What I'm going to highlight today is in three parts, um, the genesis of the project, of the, of the book project, uh, some of its themes, and I would like to conclude by saying something about what I mean with that object 51, because the book title is of course, um, a history of IP and 50 objects. So in, um, in universities, we do all sorts of interesting um, uh, research, but some of that research only circulates um, within a very particular niche. And some of it is um, highly specialized in nature, and often it is written in a language that is full of jargon that most people um, don't understand. So very real questions that academics face, especially in the light of uh, certain funding applications are, um, you know, what is the best way to reach my audience? How do you make that research tangible to a relatively lay audience? And how do you package it up in, in such a way that it actually speaks to people? And, and maybe most importantly, is it possible to communicate it in a jargon-free manner? So um, the world out there, as, as we like to call it, is pretty good at packaging uh, their message to a wide audience. So in 2010, for instance, there was this podcast called um, A History of the World in 100 Objects. And this was a 100-part series for BBC Radio by Neil McGregor, who was then uh, the director of the British Museum. And the podcast explored world history from uh, somewhat 2 million years ago to, to the present in um, 100 Objects. And then in 2011, uh, a book with the same title uh, followed. And this was uh, a killer formula. The, the world caught on very quickly, um, you know, and using this format for all sorts of interesting uh, spin offs. So um, in 2013, for instance, we had this really interesting book, A History of Cricket in 100 Objects. Uh, that year, uh, we also saw uh, A History of the World in 12 Maps. Uh, in light of the centenary of the First World War, three books with the same title came out. Uh, these were by different authors and different publishers, but two of these even came out in, in the same week. Um, I'm originally from Holland, so I, I particularly like this one, the Netherlands, an objective self-portrait in 51 objects. Um, and uh, another example would be the World Cup in 100 objects, a, a formula, it seems, um, quite literally for everything. And in 2019, we added to this collection a uh, history of uh, IP in 50 objects. Um, my co-editor, Dan Hunter, who's the Foundation Dean of Swinburne Law School in Melbourne, Australia, he tossed his idea around um, of doing this with IP, um, you know, somewhere in, in 2014. And when he and I then had our first conversation early in 2015, when I applied for a postdoc at Swinburne, um, he told me that uh, whoever he was going to hire, he'd like to work with him on this project. And I got the, the fellowship and we slowly started to figure out how this was going to work. Uh, it took a few years to finish it, but uh, here we are. Um, and I have the feeling we worked so very hard on this for so long. And somehow this is a very realistic academic publishing uh, turnaround cycle, uh, you know, three to four years. 
So the book is a crossover between an academic publication and a very richly illustrated coffee table book to make it, um, you know, uh, 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 appeal to a very broad audience. And as I said, we, we published it with Cambridge University Press uh, out of the law division in uh, New York. And it now retails for $30 or just under um, 18 pounds. Um, so intellectual property, uh, as, as you might be aware, is the, is the set of laws that primarily encompasses uh, copyright, patent, and trademark law. It also includes uh, trade secrets and publicity rights. And it is one of the most important structuring systems in uh, modern society as it underpins all of these vast industries, right? In aerospace, architecture, pharmaceutics, and then um, my own interest, media and um, entertainment. Uh, IP laws are complicated. They are arcane and few people understand why they should care about, for example, copyright law or the grant of a patent or the registration of a trademark. And, um, you know, the, the, the IP system uh, didn't exist in its modern form until uh, the 18th century and nowadays. Um, the um, IP system profoundly affects uh, global trade and is at the heart of modern policy relating to um, creativity uh, and innovation. So I, I went a little fast there. So these laws, you know, define the modern era and without them, we wouldn't have these famous brands like Coca-Cola or Sony or any of these others that are also featured um, in the book. So um, the, without these laws, um, you know, the internet wouldn't exist. Uh, we wouldn't have an iPhone in our pockets. And um, so we thought that in this book, we would bring together a group of 50 contributors who uh, have been drawn not only from law and history, but also sociology, media studies, and even horticulture. And they span uh, a wide geographical range. Um, and in their chapters, they focus on 50 objects to tell as jargon-free as possible, a history of the IP system and why it matters today. These objects demonstrate the importance of the IP system and they invite questions about various aspects of its multifaceted development. And they also show us how IP has developed and worked within human um, history and show their influence on, on a range of historical events. Um, and perhaps most importantly, um, they are each at the core of a, of a great individual story. So some of these objects um, have so profoundly impacted our lives that it's hard to know what we would be without them. And at the same time, their history is deeply entangled with the IP system. So some examples are, uh, of course, the light bulb, uh, the escalator, um, and Wi-Fi. Uh, the objects included are sometimes very specific and unique, such as this uh, 16th uh, century map of Rome, uh, for instance, uh, or Cerrone's portrait of uh, Oscar Wilde. Um, but sometimes they are as ubiquitous as the football. And these objects attest to their relation with the world in which they were born, as well as their enduring meaning in the world today. They have shaped human interactions and they have shaped, been shaped by them. Um, why approach the topic of IP through objects at all? Uh, we could have told the history of the global IP system via a list of the laws that were enacted or the case that were litigated, and we had uh, several reasons. So first of all, objects are shortcuts to the social implications of the laws that we are interested in um, addressing. And an examination of the Betamax, for instance, is a story about a, a U.S. Supreme Court case that uh, rewrote copyright law, but also about the concept of time shifting that was at the heart of this case. So recording something off the television in order to rewatch it later. And that's a concept that has come to structure modern media consumption and provide the basis for the creation of Napster, Google and um, arguably uh, Netflix. Objects are also tangible, which makes them really interesting in the context of uh, IP. 
because IP law aspires for a separation between the thing and, and the idea of the thing, as we like to call it. Um, ideas cannot be protected. Uh, it's their tangible expressions that can be. But IP law also serves to remind us that it's never possible to entirely separate the thing from the idea of the thing. And so the chapter on the Barbie doll, for instance, shows that this doll is a tangible example, not only of a toy that was originally protected by a patent, but also of a company's attempt through its litigation strategy to protect that doll's uh, chaste image. Objects are also imbued with ideologies and practices of, uh, of intellectual property. So the contribution on the football, for instance, uses the object of the football in the story of the game of football um, about wealth production based on IP and the exclusivity um, these bring. And lastly, we often rely on material objects to stand in for immaterial issues. So the dominant metaphors for the early years of digital technology um, were all material. So pipes, cars, and the super highways that would transport us to a new world. And so similarly in this book, the entry on the internet uses a metaphor of the hourglass to address the architecture of internet protocol. So some of the themes, um, some of the great themes of uh, IP history um, are distinctly addressed within the individual entries, but it's also in their juxtaposition that they are interconnected and other uh, themes emerge from, from that juxtaposition. So the entries on uh, Corio Celadon and the Murano glass base, uh, for instance, invite reflection on the process of innovation in the centuries before there even was uh, an intellectual property uh, system. And the chapter on the climbing rows um, raises the question how the way in which the concept of invention was conceived within the law was then altered after the patenting of this first plant, uh, the Rosa New Dawn. Uh, this chapter also addresses the possibility of the absence of a human inventor, um, as does um, the, the, the contribution on the Elstar apple in describing spontaneous mutations that can occur in the self-pollination of um, a species. A huge theme in IP is the myth of the lone inventor and this flash of genius. Um, and that's a central uh, uh, theme in multiple entries. So the chapter on the Alexander Graham Bell telephone addresses this myth by highlighting the importance of being first in patenting, as does the, the, the entry on the Morse telegraph. The entry on Steamboat Willie examines a particular zeal for patenting by an individual, in this case, Walt Disney's, um, and then inventions that are answers to other problems than originally foreseen are under scrutiny um, in entries as widely varied as um, uh, the post-it note, um, and uh, the Viagra pill. We see issues of adaptation and recognition of copyright across national borders in the chapter on Uncle Tom's Cabin um, and pioneering approaches to licensing are amongst the topics uh, of the entries of the Penguin paperback, the Lego brick, and uh, again, the Barbie doll. Uh, there are also musings on the relationship between um, copyright creativity and the public domain. They are laid out in this chapter on the deerstalker hat, um, completely centered around uh, the stories of Sh Sherlock Holmes and uh, the chapter on uh, the Mona Lisa, arguably the most copied artwork in the world. And then how copyright effectively precluded public access to a historic document is discussed in the entry on the Zapruder film. The, the notion of what actually constitutes a copy is of course a huge uh, theme that's addressed in the contribution on the photocopier, um, uh, but also highlighted in uh, this wonderful chapter on the Chanel 2255, a very coveted uh, handbag, which echoes Coco Chanel saying that imitation is the highest form of flattery, which as a business strategy is quite the contrary of the current house of uh, Chanel's, of course. And then the development of IP in response to new technologies is discussed in the chapters on the Bitcoin, the lithograph, the paper print, my own chapter, 
and uh, the 3D printer. And then to round up this section, the importance of the political context in IP um, can be seen in objects as diverse as this beautiful Ferragamo wedge um, or uh, the, the aspirin pill. Both of these objects are described as the result of limited international trade as a consequence of war. Uh, so it's Mussolini's war in Ethiopia for the wedge and the uh, First World War for um, the aspirin. And in light of the next presentation today, um, I'd like to flag up that we also have entries on geographical um, indication, a name or a sign used on products that corresponds to a specific geographical uh, uh, location or origin, such as uh, champagne. Uh, the drawback of putting something like this together is that all of these objects are somewhat uh, of a success. Uh, they have all made it to market. And as so often, of course, history is told by the victors. So we also really wanted to include that other narrative. So we needed a, a somewhat unsuccessful object to, to highlight that. And we found it in the kinetoscope, which is one of the first film projectors uh, invented by Thomas Edison at the turn of the previous uh, century. Edison's idea for this personalized viewing experience, as you see here on the left, it did not become the immediate uh, industry standard because that was, of course, projected in uh, projection in a collective setting called um, uh, the cinema. Uh, Peter Ducherny takes you through this story in this uh, wonderful uh, chapter, and he argues that Edison was about 100 years too early while paving the way for Steve Jobs and his vision for a renewed uh, personalized um, experience. Um, in preparing this presentation, it was really fun to look back over some of the entries on our master list, which is huge and comprises nearly three years of uh, information. Um, so some examples of objects that didn't make it into the book are a, a chocolate entry uh, and the trip trap chair, which is a famous example, because at some point the idea of the book was um, IP and the home, uh, but that didn't end up uh, materializing. Uh, another uh, object that also not in the book was uh, Chewy Vuitton, which is uh, the line of uh, dog toys, which would have been, I think, hilarious. But um, we felt that the topic of trademark infringement had more or less been addressed in some of the other luxury um, entries. And then uh, Brian Fry, uh, who's an IP professor uh, in the US who wrote the chapter on the Zapruder film, he liked our format of these essays on IP related objects under 2,500 words so much that he organized a contest for his uh, students with the same format and they came up with some wonderful stuff. So the Air Jordan, the, the paperclip, the Tiffany blue box, which is arguably the most famous protected color in branding, uh, the Toblerone shape and the Stradivarius. And the student who wrote uh, the entry on the violin, uh, she won the contest and as a prize, uh, she joined us in Rome for the 2018 ISHTEP conference where we had about 15 or so of the authors uh, present their objects in a workshop. But li like I said, all these objects are also not in the book. Uh, but I think, you know, if there is ever going to be a part two, uh, some of these might end up um, in there. So yes, we have often considered whether we set ourselves up for a mission impossible by attempting to tell a history in, uh, of IP and 50 objects. And I think that's why we also have to focus on a history and it's not called the history. Um, if any of you would have put this book together, perhaps some of these objects would have overlapped, but the chances are very likely you would have chosen 50 different uh, objects. And I have come to, um, accept that. It's, it's perfectly possible. Uh, there are many, many different histories of IP to tell, and this is just uh, the tip of um, the iceberg. So there are several ways to engage with the book. You're obviously welcome to devour uh, its contents chronologically from cover to cover. Uh, alternatively, you can engage with the entries within one of the discrete ages, as indicated by the different color bars at the far uh, outer edge of the opening page of each chapter. So here you can see gray for the pre-modern uh, period, yellow for the age of invention, uh, red for modern times, green for the consumption age, 
and blue for the digital now. You can also opt for just following one of the regimes, so trademark, for instance, by following the information in the front matter at the start of the chapters. And yet another possibility is to follow a theme. It can be a theme that we have actively planted. So if you would like to follow the strand on women's history, for instance, you can start at the corset, uh, then proceed to the Kodak camera, uh, jump to the Ferragamo wedge, uh, and end at the contraceptive pill and uh, the Barbie doll. You can also keep coming back to the same, uh, you know, your favorite individual entry, and then perhaps at some point let the images retell the story of that chapter, because that's how it's set up as a relationship between the images and the text. Okay, so for the final part, um, I'd like to focus on this concept of Object 51. The book is, uh, is a relatively complex publishing project that doesn't only bring together 50 authors, which is complex enough, but it's also richly illustrated with a high production value. And the story of the making off of the book provides insight into the differences between you know, IP theory on one hand and the cultural practices uh, on the other. And it tells an IP story all of its own. And the book itself, I think, can therefore be seen as uh, object 51. So Susan Bielstein, who is executive editor at the University of Chicago, wrote this wonderful book called uh, Permissions, a Survival Guide, Blonde Talk About Art as Intellectual Property. And she writes that there are three things that you need to publish visuals. And that is copyright permission, if the image is still in copyright, um, the use permission for that image, so permission from the institution or the person who can administer the image, which indeed might be someone entirely different from the rights holder. And of course, the image itself, and preferably in high uh, reproduction quality. Ideally, you have all three if you need them. But once you have the image, you can get pretty far under copyright um, exceptions. I have done the image research and the rights clearance and the design of the book myself. And it was absolutely wonderful to keep it all in one place, which was in my head. But um, I would like to add that I think you need a crucial fourth uh, element and that is tenacity. And for completeness sake, um, you also need a fifth, which is and may maybe that's the very first thing you need is a fantastic editor who pulls the project from the inside and who dares to take risks. So many, many thanks to Matt Galloway at Cambridge, um, who was absolutely stellar to, uh, to work with. I would like to rewind a little bit. So at the time of our book proposal, when we proposed it to the publisher, um, I proposed, sorry, I produced this dummy. So in order to think through some of the content decisions that we had to make, we thought it would be a good idea to visualize some of these decisions. So how much information was going into the front matter, for instance, and that uh, in, in a way turned out to be um, serendipitous um, foresight. Because what happened was not only did this visual support get us a deal quite quickly, because Cambridge had a, a, a quick idea of what this, what the potential of the book was and what it was going to look like, but uh, to put it together, I had already used mostly Getty images. It turned out that um, Cambridge University Press had a premium access account with Getty. And which is a subscription account for near limitless downloading of images for use in their books, which a lot of uh, uh, publishing houses have. And so whatever images are available under that deal to them would be available to me in designing the book. Um, so that was that was wonderful. Um, but we needed to find out what the extra budget for rights clearance was going to be. Um, so at some point I made a calculation based on this dummy, which at that time represented about half of the book, so about 25 entries, and it included a bit of everything. So some pattern drawings, as you see here, which are images clearly in the public domain for which you don't have to uh, pay. Some images that we would be able to source via the authors, as you see here, and some from image banks. Um, so. But we also, on top of that, knew that we were going to need material from outside sources. 
So for the Zapruder film, for instance, we knew that we needed to go to the Sixth Floor Museum in Dallas to license these stills from the actual film, which aren't available uh, anywhere else, at least not in uh, this high of a, of a quality that I needed for the book. Um, based on this dummy, I came up with a number and mapped that onto the whole book. And we sort of settled on 4,000 pounds, which uh, Cambridge uh, didn't have. And so uh, Dan and I went to our respective deans and we quickly secured uh, half of that each. Uh, so that was really wonderful that our universities participated and Cambridge was very happy with that solution. And we were, um, we were in business. So the permission culture that you encounter in attempting to obtain these requirements um, includes legal fundamentals, but it also includes cultural assumptions of ownership and commodification. And I had to accept, for instance, that we, albeit not directly, but through Cambridge with this Getty deal, we were actually paying licensing fees for paintings in the public domain. And although I just mentioned that, you know, if it's in the public domain, you can get it for free. That's only the case if you can find a high enough uh, resolution of the image. So here we were paying for public domain uh, paintings. My process has included navigating institutional access to image banks and negotiations with uh, directors, agents, their assistants, as well as artists' estates, museums, and all sorts of other uh, individuals. But the biggest hurdle were uh, the images related to famous brands. Because if you type in, for instance, Barbie doll and Getty, uh, you get a lot of very creative stock photography as you see here, but not anything that we were interested in. So on the left, you see a Barbie doll floating in a, a swimming pool. And on the right, you see um, a woman I, I allegedly dressed up as, as a Barbie doll. But those were not images that, um, you know, uh, told the story of the particular chapter. So I remember mocking up the Barbie doll chapter twice, once with the so-called free images uh, from Getty, uh, this is what you see on the left, and ones as if I had no constraint. I was like, you know, as an exercise, I want to try that, and what would that look like? And it was, of course, immediately clear which one represented the litigation story of Mattel best, right? The story that the chapter tells. So from that exercise, there was really only one way forward, and it was a difficult decision, but um, that I was going to attempt to get permission for every single image that we had to source outside of Getty but then within that budget of £4,000. I'm very happy to say that I was able to get all the images uh, I wanted, although in the last few weeks before the deadline, when you know we really, really uh, sped up, there were a few that I let go of because they would have required additional time and um, clearing costs. And these all pertain to celebrities. So for instance, here you see artist Jeff Koons with his uh, Mona Lisa bag, and that was a restricted asset. And so was the top picture uh, on the right of Brianna Scurry, who was the goalie of the US women's soccer team, who I really wanted for uh, the football chapter. But it was very easy to find these alternatives um, that you see at the bottom that both uh, the authors of the chapters and, and I were, were happy with. So there were only a few exceptions of things um, I couldn't get. Now to uh, start concluding, uh, the, the wonderful thing about putting together a book in which more than 50% of the contributors are scholars um, of IP and or lawyers, because most of them uh, are both, is that there's always uh, someone to ask for help. And one of them is the wonderful Professor Peter Yazi, who is a worldwide specialist on fair use, which is a doctrine in US law that permits um, limited use of copyright material without having to first acquire permission from the rights holder. And a few years ago, over dinner one night, I had a conversation with him about me going to do this myself. And I was really happy that Cambridge let me design the book. Um, but, you know, I was I was kind of nervous about the, the whole uh, clearance uh, side of things. And he offered to help. And he really wasn't kidding. I must have sent him, um, I don't know, hundreds of emails and always with the same wonderful impatience and insights. Um, he sent me another detailed uh, explanation. So uh, that was just a, 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 
a wonderful experience. Um, so there are two things here. We could have fair used a lot of images, especially because we use them for the purposes of um, illustration and the story that we're already telling. And as long as you have a high res reproducible image, it's relatively easy to go down that route. And it might also be worth saying that if you cannot get any permission and you don't have a good quality image, then you cannot invoke uh, fair use. You need uh, source material to, to do so. But what was really important uh, as an additional layer for a book like this is that it's not only the legal situation. You, you kind of want to be able to say image courtesy of Salvatore Ferragamo, right? That's a really nice thing to say that the brand is on board or courtesy of Todd Haynes uh, for the stills of his film uh, Superstar or Universal Denmark for the Aqua a still of I'm a Barbie girl uh, music video. And in these last two cases, I already had the image, the images because they were screenshots from audiovisual material, for instance, and I upscaled them. Um, and in both cases, the people being able to give the permission didn't even have high res images to uh, available to send to me. So it was um, quite an interesting uh, situation. So in all these cases, I've gone down the permission route first. All images were cleared for worldwide use in English and to cover the initial hardcover uh, publication. Um, only in the cases in which we didn't get permission from the rights holders, we have fair use the images. So for instance, for the post-it uh, note chapter, HBO did not give permission for a still from Sex in the City um, and everybody who's approximately my age knows this reference uh, in one of the episodes, a burger famously breaks up with Carrie on a post-it uh, and the author of the chapter also really wanted to use that anecdote. And as Peter Yazi states in his wonderful Reclaiming Fair News book, the owner's refusal to license may even increase your case for fair use if the material is important to what you're, to what you're trying to say. So we've added uh, in, in the caption of the image that we are fair using uh, this image. Chanel also denied permission to our use of the ad on the left you see here, the one with the black border around it, in which they tell the fashion industry how they prefer their trademarks to be used. And their denial of the ad had nothing to do with this image. They actually objected to the content of the chapter because it discusses Coco Chanel's Second World War history, and they suggested a rewrite. And so um, they like to, um, they, they wanted to uh, thwart, you know, the use of this image. And so we ended up fair using um, this image. Sony told me that the ad agency that made this Betamax ad held the copyright, but when I spoke to them, they of course referred me back to Sony because it would have been a very unusual construction if the ad agency had the copyright to the ad rather than the client. But I danced back and forth a few more times between them until I decided to just go out and try to find the images elsewhere. And I had enough of a paper trail uh, with their answer, should it ever come to, to needing that. So I bought, for instance, old editions of Time magazine uh, on eBay for this Jack Valenti portrait in the chapter, which, uh, which I ended up just scanning from, from the magazine. And through looking for images for another entry, I found out that Duke University has this magnificent advertisement archive and they do the research for you. So I asked them to pull everything that they had on Betamax in 1977 and 78, uh, which is the time around which this ad came out. And for $25 each, I purchased uh, high rest scans of these ads. And when I then double checked with Peter for fair use, his answer was yes, yes, and yes for these three images. So that was wonderful. And my last example, I think is the funniest. Um, I found several images for the entry on the Singer sewing machine at the Library of Congress. And um, the information given there is that the copyright is owned by the Singer manufacturing uh, company. 
Now, after many emails back and forth, to which then an increasing amount of lawyers were copied into, I finally received the answer that Singer Worldwide wasn't able to confirm whether they owned the copyright to these two images as the company was bought and sold so many times that these images might actually be orphan works and we don't know where to locate um, the, the rights owner or who they even are. So they stated that they wouldn't do anything legally to stop us, but that they also weren't giving their approval to move forward. Now, if that isn't legalese, then um, I, I don't know what, so I didn't know what to do. Um, and so instead they suggested to list the company. And if any of the readers to our book would be interested to learn more about Singer or buy one of their machines, that they could visit uh, www.singer.com. I thought that was such a funny message. And I consulted with Professor Lionel Bentley, who wrote this chapter, and we decided to write that entire email answer from a singer as a caption to the image. So what you here see in the italics next to the two columns of text is uh, the actual text of the email of, of singer back to me. So um, what happens is uh, we've provided this editorial commentary like this in the caption on multiple occasions. And uh, I think I might have to write an entirely separate paper on, you know, what I call my adventures in, in rights clearance and, and object um, 51. Um, so now for the, for the real conclusion, I would like to give you a few numbers so that you can, can get a sense of what this means. So uh, the most expensive chapter to clear was the Ferragamo Wedge. It uh, cost a total of 488 uh, pounds for, for all these images. And this was with the help of uh, uh, the, the Ferragamo um, you know, corporation. I mean, the, the wedge that you see, for instance, we got for free, but it was some of these other of the more vintage shoes that were um, really expensive. The uh, most expensive single image is this Mike Tyson portrait. This was 300 pounds, but it was such a strong picture. Um, I just couldn't consider uh, replacing it. I, I just have never seen a portrait where he has his face to two uh, that is more poignant than, than this one. So um, I think it was worth that amount and I just had to make a little room in the budget um, elsewhere. Um, the image that took the longest to clear is maybe not unsurprisingly this Coca-Cola bottle. It took seven months of relentless nagging and I'm not I'm not overstating, uh, but as soon as uh, the marketing team of Coca-Cola had signed off on this, um, it just all went rather quickly and uh, it was incredible. The doors opened, I could request whatever I wanted. They gave me so many options and all the images we got for free plus they gave us the um uh the the, the go ahead of using uh, a coca-cola bottle on the cover of the book which also was not um unimportant so that was wonderful um i would like to ask you a question and you can put it in the chat or you can open up your mic if you are allowed to and give me uh, an estimate but i would like to ask if anybody can guess how much it would have cost to clear all the images in the book if Cambridge would not have had that deal with Getty. So for completeness to say, there are 358 images in the book. And I also like to be fair in the case that Cambridge would not have had that deal, there probably would not be that many or almost all of them would have been under fair use. Uh, but I would like to ask if anybody can guess how much it would have cost to clear the entire book. If anybody can give me an answer. I cannot see the chat. Are there any answers? Shall I just give the answer? Okay, 
So the answer is, now I have to click here, 90,000 pounds. I hope that uh, sufficiently um, astonishes you. It did me when I did the calculation. I thought that was a, a crazy amount of money. Of course, you know, uh, it didn't cost that, but I, I just wanted to do the exercise. Um, good thing is that, you know, uh, it didn't cost uh, 90,000 pounds to clear the book. Um, and this is aside from, you know, not having to pay a designer or, a, you know, a, a fee for clearance and stuff. We, we all did that ourselves. Uh, but of course, the best news is, is that uh, this final version is um, available for um, for only 18 pounds. I have a hard copy in my um, in my book rack and I can take it and I can show it to you later. It's quite a hefty uh, tone. Um, that was the end of uh, my talk. Um, thank you so much for your attention. And uh, later on, I would love to take any questions that any of you um, might have. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Claudie, ma'am, for your enlightening uh, talk. I never knew uh, uh, that doing this book was such a, uh, what to say, no, tiring uh, experience, I must say, but uh, what a treasure it has created for all of us to cherish in long term. Definitely, I'll ask my library uh, in the university to have a copy so that we, uh, as IPRs, can also enlighten our students and have a resource to uh, look into in later hours. So <clears throat> coming back, uh, when we are talking about copyrights, it's something in the global terms we were talking and looking into things. Let us, let us now come back to uh, the regional uh, terms of IPR. Uh, how we can strengthen regional economies through geographical indications. Actually, uh, by and large, we have seen there are a lot of uh, products and crafts uh, which are originating from the rural uh, regions, rural environments, uh, which have typical flavor, which are unique to their identity in their tastes. Uh, but uh, we see at most of the time, they do not end up actually um, giving benefit to the producers. And today's uh, talk is based on analyzing those loose facets where, uh, where we can actually uh, join the things together to see if we can use it in a better way. So um, when we had gone through various reports and study materials, uh, we found that there's a, a lack of well-defined um, and recognized characterization of these products. And there's also a lack of regulation and enforcement mechanism. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, though we had a legal, though we have a legal system from 1999 in India uh, regarding geographic indications, uh, which is giving us an institutional tool to protect such products. But uh, we actually uh, lack a system where uh, the consumers are aware enough uh, asking for such tags and uh, we get an opportunity where the rural producers can actually get benefited. So <clears throat> we know uh, by definition that geographic indications are um, names or signs of products that have specific geographical origin and have special qualities for which they have the reputation. And all these qualities arise because they originate from a particular place. And these qualities, uh, because of which they have this unique property or reputation, depend largely on the environment they grow in or largely in the environment they are produced. And that's why we draw a clear link between the product and its place of origin. <clears throat> Pondering upon the underlying economic economics of uh, why uh, there is a uh, gap uh, between the uh, market and the, the benefit that should reach the producer and the willing consumers, we find that the theories say uh, there is a there's a market distortion which arises due to the asymmetry of information between the producers and the consumers. And because of this distortion, 
uh, there are consequences also. Um, and uh, if everything uh, is in place and every, every system is in place, then we can actually think of actually uh, producing or creating a niche market for such beautiful regional products and give an opportunity to these wonderful producers in regional uh, areas, in the rural areas, to move away from the community market and actually go into the lucrative niche markets. And uh, we now see uh, there is a growing demand and attention towards uh, these specialized products because there's an increased awareness because of uh, whatever uh, information we get in the web or social uh, networks, and also the kind of renewed interest and nostalgia for the culinary history. If we talk about the food, regional food, we actually find such actually factors helping again for the uh, renewed attention towards these products. For example, uh, you know this uh, pounds and cheese, when we talk about pizza, we talk about uh, pastas, we also talk about parmesan cheese, but we also know that it is one of the most imitated forms of cheese across the world, though originally the actual uh, parmesan cheese should originate from uh, Reggiano region of Italy, but with this name we find a lot of uh, uh, pirated products. Uh, now coming to the uh, origin label products, how these are important? These are very important uh, because these increase value of the product because people associate value with certain places to, uh, to some kind of uh, products. Uh, for example, mozzarella cheese. Mozzarella cheese, we know these are used in certain kind of food and these are only fine in uh, Italy and made from buffalo's milk. And uh, with the lockdown in many of us have tried various other uh, kind of dishes that we generally order from outside. But we, when we have started trying, many of us have started trying at home. So we may have also ordered these cheeses online, but we do not know the uh, actually um, how authentic these are. So this is the way the uh, infringement or piracy actually uh, starts working when we do not look in for the authentic products and we actually give away with whatever is delivered to us. So this is the way it starts. Uh, in case of champagne, all of us know um, champagne is a luxury um, alcoholic beverage and uh, the real champagne actually um, uh, originates from a county called Champagne in France. But uh, uh, it is, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's found in the market where champagne uh, bottles are written in the way, but these are not probably originating from champagne. And, uh, but the uh, dedicated clientele of champagne is not diminishing because of it is highly priced. It is increasing because we find the major share of consumers of champagne belong to the top 10% of the earning population. And here is the population who actually look forward for the fine quality. They go for the exclusivity of the product and that's why they're willing for paying the premium prices associated with such uh, regional products, GI tech product. Probably you all know uh, champagne in India is a GI registered product. Uh, coming back to India, um, in India, though we had um, the law from 1999, um, we had the first registration in 2004, but uh, till now we have uh, uh, individual names protected, individual logos protected. There was there were no uh, common logos actually making us identify this is the regional product, this is the regional protected product. But government has made the things easier now. After 2018, um, the uh, Department of Commerce has actually uh, made a, a specialized logo for all the uh, GI registered products in India with the tagline Atulya Bharati Atulya Nidhi. So uh, you may know that uh, the tagline for tourism, uh, Department of Tourism is Atulya Bharat. 
So somewhere tourism is uh, connected with the regional products. So the tagline is also connected in that way. So probably the government wants that the uh, tourism is connected with the regional products of that uh, area. Uh, what is the effect after this logo is launched? Uh, this uh, logo shall be uh, displayed in all the GI listed products with the tagline and it will actually certify that uh, these are all GI product, products irrespective of the category into which these are registered and um, it will ensure that similar products from elsewhere cannot be sold in the same name and most importantly all the airports in the country shall have a stock displaying GI products and self-help group products. So it is uh, at the moment hoped and that this will actually help the rural economy in remote areas, supplementing the incomes of rural artisans and farmers and weavers. Some of the regional products that you may be knowing or may not be knowing, yeah, I, I just wish to uh, make you acquainted with. Page for Lichia, the place I belong to has a GI product in the agri uh, Sector. It is a lychee, uh, which is a very unique taste. It has a different kind of a structure uh, and it has a very good texture and it is a very high quality product because of which it is exported most of the time. So it has now got the GI tag uh, from the state of Assam. Then we have the uh, Naga Mirji uh, or Bhut Jolokia, uh, which has actually been registered from the state of Nagaland but also found in Assam in certain places because Northeast was undivided at some point of time. So um, this is one of the um, hottest chilies uh, in the world. At the, mo at the moment, it's not the most uh, hot chili, but one of the few hottest chilies across the world. So um, it has got this uh, thing, registration. Pashmina shawl is from Kashmir. You know, it's a very unique handicraft and crafted material and uh, it is very difficult to identify also if you visit Kashmir you will not be able to identify if you wish to take it back if it is a, a pure Pashmina or it's a pirated thing so now it has got the GI this means we will not have if we ask for probably we will get a tagged uh, product Madhubani painting for example uh, is from Bihar you know it is a handicraft uh, it's artwork and it is GI product. And from your own place, uh, this is a Mysore sandal soap, though it is available for a long time, but the authentic Mysore sandal soap is now GI tagged. So we can actually go for the uh, real product with the certification. Uh, we have another addition uh, because uh, if in Northeast we have a lot of citrus products. You know, Northeast areas are uh, bi biodiversity hotspots. So we have a lot of uh, entries from the um, agricultural and horticultural sectors. So here there's a special uh, citrus fruit called Kazi Nemu, which is only found in Assam. It's a kind of lemon from this part of area. The specific taste and aroma. Now, uh, the most important, uh, uh, actually lacking part that I found is that though we get the GI products, uh, the marketing is very much uh, not at par that it should have been to make the consumer aware of the uh, unique properties it has. During pandemic, we, are, we were all actually very concerned about how we can go with the home remedies and how we can actually enhance our immune system. And most of us had turmeric with milk or turmeric in some way or the other and other spices which could actually help us boost our immunity. Uh, and <clears throat> in a local market, we were actually looking for the turmeric. But <clears throat> during the same time, I have found that there was a turmeric from Meghalaya region, Meghalaya uh, in the Laktong region, which is actually identified to have a very high curcumin uh, content and now marketed very vigorously uh, by uh, under the Zizira brand. And very nicely, they have actually uh, placed that product uh, with the strong characteristics so that the uh, the common consumer can, can actually identify the characteristics and uh, get interested to buy that. 
uh, it is applied for GI, it has not yet got the GI, but I'm very sure that it will soon get the GI. But I, I was very really enthralled by looking into the marketing strategy because unless and until the demand actually rises from the consumer side, um, uh, the producers do not feel uh, the requirement or do not feel the uh, push to use the GI tag. So only if they use it uh, properly in the marketing uh, channel, then only the return can be ensured back to them. We all know we have to apply uh, in Chennai, in the geography education industry for a GI product. And there are also controversies with GI products. Some states, uh, if I'm not talking about the Northeastern states, there are other states in the mainland who are actually very, very conscious and very, very fiercely they are uh, fighting for the GI status because they know once they get the status, they can use it for advertisement, they can use it for pushing up the sales and also as a kind of, uh, as an identity, they can actually uh, tell the world that this is something that has originated in our place and this is what our identity, cultural uh, identity is. So one of such uh, thing is Rasagulla from uh, West Bengal. So, uh, in 2017, they have acquired the Rasgulla, uh, GI for the Rasgulla uh, as uh, the Bangla Rasgulla. And Orissa actually also were uh, following them. They were not satisfied with this um, judgment and they uh, applied for another GI uh, with the name Orissa's um, Rasgulla, Orissa's Rasgulla. So they eventually got in 2019. So uh, they two GIs in the same product because they could show that these are two different uh, products with different origination, with different flavor and distinctive characters. So both of the states have got the GI. The first GI, if you will look into the history when uh, India started having the GI products uh, in the country, it was only in 2004 that we got the first GI in Darjeeling tea. You know Darjeeling tea is exported and uh, there's a lot, large probability of having it actually infringed. Um, we have got the GI looking into the prospects of its infringement and the kind of revenue it earns for the country. And finally, at the moment, we have 317th uh, entry uh, from Jharkhand, uh, which is a handicraft. Uh, painting, uh, which is called the GI. So this is the uh, present scenario. If I talk about my own state, Assam, actually we got the first GI in 2007, uh, which was applied by the uh, Assam Science Technology and Environment Council, a body from the government of Assam. Uh, and um, Later on in 2014, it got uh, the logo registered. First, the name was registered, Mugasika of Assam, and then the logo was registered. And in 2008, actually, we got the second uh, GI for the state that was for the Orthodox tea of Assam. You know, a lot of uh, tea from the state is exported, and the Orthodox tea is one such uh, variety of tea which is actually loved by the people outside the country also. And that's why it is required that the uniqueness of the tea is highlighted in the packaging. <clears throat> By and large, if you see uh, for the state of Assam, we have these few uh, GIs registered. Only few have the logo, like this uh, Muga Silk of Assam does has, and the, uh, the Orthodox tea of Assam has Joha Sao, Joha rice, this is the right, aromatic rice variety. It also has uh, GI and Kazi Nemo also has the logo, but others mostly have the name registered. Now, um, the beauty with the logo is that it helps us to identify it instantly. If you do not know the name, also, it's easier for us to identify. For other states uh, the, uh, surrounding Assam, we have Arunachal Pradesh having Arunachal Orange. Then we have Nagaland, as I already mentioned to you, the Naga Mirchi and the Naga tree tomato, which has got the GI registered. We have the Tripura Queen pineapple, which has got the GI registration. We have large cardamom from Sikkim, which has got GI registration. 
and also we have the bird eye chili from Mizoram, which is for the registration. We have Manipur with actually three handicrafts and one uh, citrus fruit, which is called registration for the GI, and Meghalaya with two citrus fruits getting registration. This is the entire process, and we know it is valid for 10 years and it can be renewed. Um, after 10 years, but it is a matter of fact how we actually use uh, the GI to its maximum potential. Only then we can actually ensure benefit uh, to the registered GI. In case of Assam, uh, for the Muga, we actually did an uh, extensive study. We have actually found that though the registration was done by the government body, many of the people residing in very remote places who actually work for uh, this craft, we act who actually rear the silkworm, who are engaged in weaving, do not know about this uh, GI registration. They do not know what is the benefit. And that's why they had not registered themselves for the authorized registration, authorized user registration. So unless and until one is authorized user, they cannot actually use this tag uh, into their finished products in spite of the fact that they are producing pure product, but still they have to register themselves in the GI registry with some formalities done, and only then they can use this in the final product. Now, uh, these people uh, who are very uh, innocent uh, people, uh, they hardly know about this kind of registration. And that's why we find in the market, there are no actually users at all uh, for this registration. Till 2014, and then we actually from our cell try to uh, make them aware and help them register themselves as authorized user. And now more than 300 uh, weavers are registered authorized users who can use this logo in their uh, in the finished products or whatever uh, uh, product they are dealing in that uh, cycle of Muga production. Now. Uh, there is an information uh, asymmetry as we uh, discussed in the earlier uh, slides that why this is not happening, why the return is not coming. Because uh, as the demand grows, only the certifications actually are used by the producers or the traders. Now, uh, when uh, in the lockdown, we have seen most of the people have equipped themselves for online marketing, online uh, selling of the things. Uh, in case of silk and handicrafts, in our state, we have seen people have been advocating using the silk mark to actually uh, assert the purity of uh, silk products. In, but in case of Muga, this is a unique silk from the state of Assam. Uniqueness lies in the fact that unlike other silks, this silk doesn't get damaged when you wash the silk. Uh, the longevity of the silk is 100 years, more than 100 years. This kind of uh, silk is passed on from the grandmothers to the granddaughters and they, this silk doesn't get damaged when you wear it or, or wash it. This is one of the very strong uh, silks found in the nature. This is a wild variety of silk. Now, the pure uh, Muga silk uh, is costly because rearing of this uh, silk is difficult. Uh, now, uh, because of the pollution, the entire production has come down in various places. So uh, many a times we find uh, the production is adulterated with another cheaper form of silk. And uh, this cheaper form, the larger the tusser silk is dyed and starched. And then uh, it is mixed with the muga yarns. And then uh, the entire production cost is brought down. At the first instance, when you buy, when we buy the muga silk, the muga silk uh, fabric, we do not uh, we cannot understand if there is a mixing of the silks. But when you use it repeatedly or when you wash it once, you will be able to identify there is the adulteration because when the adulterated fabric is washed, it becomes very um, soft and it becomes very weak actually. But in case of a pure muga, it doesn't actually uh, uh, subject it to wear and tear. It, it stays strong if the shine actually increases further when you wash it and repeat the use. So um, we have been advocating uh, to the weavers that you use GI mark so that you can assert the purity. You don't have to actually bargain for 
um, the proper price. You don't have to repeatedly tell about the price that you deserve for this thing. But um, uh, we are not very satisfied by their response. So uh, it is the um, it is the duty of the informed consumers also to look in for. Uh, such labels so that the demand generates. And also I looked in for um, proper online platforms where the traditional uh, products are actually sold, but I haven't found uh, a proper platform which correctly gives information uh, about such uh, these things, traditional um, products. One of, one of the uh, products that I, uh, sorry, one of the, um, Uh, one of the uh, websites that I went to is this one, the stateplate.com. Okay, so here uh, you can shop by state. Okay, there is a um, tab for Assam. When you tab it, you get this thing, this page. But if you will if you will go through the products, even the information is not correct because this lockdown turmeric is not our, our thing. Then Bujjalukya is also not technically uh, now resisted in the name of Assam. Many of the products are not properly labeled. Okay, bamboo shoot. I mean, uh, if, if there's a GI in some form of, there's a carbium long ginger, which is actually GI resisted, but the, the labeling is not proper. The information asymmetry does exist even in these online platforms. Uh, there's another, uh, website called nativesspecial.com. Here you will find Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, but all the states are not featured. And I don't know uh, if the products which are showcased actually are correctly uh, informed, correctly labeled. Another website, ethnicpip.com, also actually um, doesn't give a, a state-wise buying option. And the Amazon Carrigar at the end, I found that actually it is, it is showing emporium wise, but the, the list is not very exhaustive. The list is very limited to few few states, okay? So this means uh, there are certain state, states you will never get a platform to showcase the regional um, specialties, regional products. So uh, we, uh, we will have to work uh, to bring down this asymmetry and actually work uh, for um, actually strengthening the regional economies by uh, bridging this gap. Um, so I come to end of my presentation. If you have any questions, you can ask me.